Good to see you all. Uh, let's open up our Bibles to Luke chapter 18 this morning. And uh, we have finished up Deuteronomy. We were studying Deuteronomy and the first five books of the Bible for a long time. I, uh, in, in, uh, in June, I will have been here at Revival with the high school group uh, for six years. And uh, we started Genesis way back uh, way back when, way back then. And uh, very few of you have been here for the entire thing. Sarah's been here for the entire thing. Uh, Matt and the Perrys, Perrys have been here for the entire thing. Uh, but we finally finished up uh, the book of Deuteronomy. And uh, we will be getting into Joshua, but it's going to be several weeks before we do that. Um, if you are new, you need to know that we normally do book studies. In other words, we'll start the book of Joshua chapter 1 and we'll just continue each week until we finish the entire book. Uh, but occasionally in between the book studies, like right now in between Deuteronomy and Joshua, I will teach something else. And um, I am teaching a study that this, this series, it's a four-part series, and it is a series that I have taught before. It's called Stopping for Directions. I've actually taught it several times over the last almost six years. And um, it, the, as the title suggests, that's exactly what it is. It's stopping for directions. You will see underneath our, our title, we've got a subtitle there of prayer, proclamation, and participation. Those are the things that we will be talking about. We'll be discussing prayer this morning uh, or this afternoon. Uh, there are only three topics, but one of those topics is split up into two parts. And so that's where we get our four parts from. But it's stopping for directions. That's exactly what it is. We're stopping in between Deuteronomy and Joshua to ask a question. The question is, where are we going? Well, we're going into Joshua. I know. But as a youth ministry, as a high school ministry, as a youth group, what are we doing here? Is Sunday mornings, Wednesday nights, the things that we do, is it just a social experiment, just a social event? Well, there obviously is lots of... Uh, social activity going on every time we gather on a Sunday, on a Wednesday, or next Saturday when we get together for our Nerf war and shoot darts at one another. There's always the social aspect. That's a big part of it. But that's not the only reason that we gather. If we were only gathering for the social aspect, then we wouldn't need to call it a church youth group. Uh, we could cancel this. You could stay in bed longer, and you could just get together with all of your friends you know, at the mall later on or something like that. What are we doing here? We want to ask ourselves that question. And every so often, we need to stop for directions and ask that. If you were on a hike and uh, maybe you've got a map or there's a map on your app that you're following, every once in a while you want to stop and go, okay, where are we at? All right, yeah, that's right. Okay, we're here. Okay, we're heading in the right direction. You want to make sure you're not going in the wrong direction. Uh, but you could be walking through the city. Let's say you take a day trip into San Diego or L.A., or some, or some other place, some larger city, and every once in a while you have to stop and go, okay, wait, wait, wait a minute, where, where, which way are we going? Which direction are we headed in? Or, you know, we want to go see the Golden Gate. Okay, well, where we're at right now, we got to head west or whatever, and you try to figure out where you're at and which direction you're headed in. But even going to the mall. Some of you will go to the mall this afternoon. Some of you have plans for that. And you will get to the mall and You'll go, okay, wait a minute, uh, which, uh, where's the food court? Or, you know, where is, you know, Forever 21? Or where is this store or whatever? And you'll be looking and you'll have to get your bearings and find out which direction am I going in? Extremely important. It's always good to know which direction we're going in. Some of you are seniors and soon you will be going off to college. And it may be a large campus or a small campus. But you'll get there and no doubt you'll get lost. Just like when you were a freshman and you first went on to the high school campus. And you got there and it's like, oh my gosh, this is so embarrassing. Where's the science building? Or, you know, where is Mr. Matthews? Or where is whatever? And you're, you're, you're lost. And so you need to stop for directions. It's always a good thing. Stop and ask for some directions. Get some directions. Uh, and so that's what we're doing here. As we're in between books, we're asking ourselves this. Hey, as a youth ministry, as a high school group, what are we doing here? Is this just social? What are we doing? And what I'm going to be doing is, over the next several weeks, sharing four things with you from these three topics. Four things that I believe with all of my heart that God placed on my heart when I came, when I first got to Revival, to take over the youth group or the high school group, 
almost six years ago. I believe, when I share these things with you, I believe that these are things that God gave me in the order that, that I present them. These are the things that God gave me for this specific youth group. Uh, these were all things that I was working on, prayer, proclamation, and participation at the previous youth ministry that I was at, but they were not ordered this way and developed this way. And so I believe that when I got here, God began to place these things heavy on my heart and on my mind and uh, gave me, I believe that the Holy Spirit gave me some order to them. And so I put them in order this way. And that's what I will be sharing with you. Now, we are going to put our media team to the test here in just a moment because I've got a video that I'm going to show you in just a moment that I, I, I'll ask to be put up. And I'll need some sound for that also from our fearless sound man, Jaden, in the back. But let me give you some context, tell you what's going on here in this video. Lately, I don't know if you knew this or not, but on several college campuses throughout the United States, there are people protesting the war between Israel and Hamas. You'll hear them say Israel and Palestine. Uh, they are protesting on college campuses. And what they are protesting is the fact that their, their college campus, their particular college campus, has some tie to Israel. They don't like that. Uh, there are also uh, Jewish students on these campuses that are being abused or attacked, uh, if not physically, verbally. And so there are these um, uh, relatively small uh, um, uh, 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 problems going on, on these campuses where people are protesting. And so this is one of them. Now, this is not a study on, uh, on, on politics or even Israel and Hamas or Israel, Palestine, whatever. It's, we're not talking about that right now. What I want you to see in this video is because it's popular, because it's been going around, although I'm not sure if any of you have seen it because it's really on, it's been on the news feeds and you probably, you know, I, I would doubt that anybody in here follows Newsmax. You know, you're like, Newsmax, what is that? Who follows news? Like, all I'm trying to find out is, you know, what kind of shoes was, was, was Yeezy wearing this week or whatever. We're not, you know, where he was at the mall. What? Oh, you know, I can't believe that. We, most of you probably don't care about the news. But the, this little clip, and it's a 30-second uh, clip, uh, is interesting as it pertains to our study time here today. Now, I'll give you a little bit of background, a little bit of context before we put it up. And that is that these are two young ladies. They've come from Columbia University to the university in New York, NYU, and they've showed up on campus to protest. However, they're not quite sure what they're protesting. And uh, it's quite embarrassing, actually. I don't put it up to make fun of them, but to give you an example of uh, individuals who are going, but they don't know where they're going and they don't have any direction. So let's go ahead and get that video up and play that for us. Port and what would you say is the main goal with tonight's uh, protest? I think the goal is just showing our support for Palestine and demanding that NYU stops. I honestly don't know okay. all of what NYU's doing. Is there something that NYU's doing? I really don't oh. know. I'm pretty sure they're, do you know what NYU's doing? About what? About Israel. Why what? are we protesting here? Uh, Palestine will be free. I wish I was more educated. I'm not either. Oh. I'm shot. Anyhow, uh, it's hard to hear because of all the protesting that's going on, but here's the deal. They've showed up to protest, and a couple seconds into the interview, she looks at her friend and goes, um, I really don't know what NYU is doing, and she looks at her friend, and then she goes, do you know what NYU is doing? And her friend's like, uh, no, I don't know what they're, what they're doing either, and then her friend says behind the mask, she says, I wish I was more educated. And then the girl turns back around to talk to the camera and explains to the person interviewing that uh, I, I, uh, I came from Columbia University. Uh, I heard that they needed our support, so we showed up. And then she says, she gives her reasons. We heard there were lots of cops, and uh, I don't remember the exact word she used at the end, but essentially she's saying, I heard there were lots of cops and that there might be some violence happening. Okay. So you as an 18, 19, 20-something-year-old heard that there were lots of cops at NYU, there's a protest going on, and there might be some violence, so you decided to show up for what? You're gonna fight the power, 
Uh, you're going to defeat the cops? Like, what were you going to do? Uh, that's an example. They had no idea what they were going to do. And that is an example of so many people, period, people, but oftentimes, especially young people. And I speak to you as somebody who formerly was young. I used to be young. And I remember, man, like, you know what? We got to just, you know, we got to hate those people. Why? I'm not really sure, but we got to hate them. No direction. And there are so many young people that do not have any direction. And we want to make sure that we, as a high school ministry, have some direction. Where are we going? What are we doing? And so that's what we're doing here is we're stopping for directions. Now, I have you opened up to Luke chapter 18, and you thought that I would never get there, but here we are. Let me go back a little bit. We are going to be talking about prayer from verses 9 to 14. Verses 9 to 14, and I want you to see that there are two. I've broken those verses up into two sections. Now, I see many of you taking notes. That's a good thing. Keep taking notes. But you will want to know that this study, for me, is set up differently than I would normally have it set up. It's starting out the same. I've got it broken up into two sections. But you will see that we will only spend a few minutes in these verses. And then I've got a series of questions that I am going to ask. I'm not expecting answers from you. I'm going to ask the questions. I'll pose the questions. And then I will give you some answers to those questions. I'm starting with prayer. This is the first of our series. Why? Because I think, this, this is my opinion, I am going to start with our weakest area or our weakest link. I think that prayer for us as a youth ministry, as a, as a group, I think that prayer is one of our weakest areas. I think that we do a fantastic job of worshiping. I think that we do a really good job of studying God's word. But prayer is one of those pillars of Christianity that I think we're weak on. From time to time, we will have a night of prayer on a Wednesday night. Obviously, we always have prayer here during our services on Sundays or on Wednesdays. Uh, at our event next Saturday when we get together to shoot each other, we'll have prayer there even. Uh, and I will say that at our last night of prayer, we have those occasionally on Wednesday nights that at our last night of prayer, I was actually quite pleased with many of you that prayed. Uh, generally speaking, when we have a time of prayer, there are very few people that pray uh, because most of us get nervous. We're not really sure. I don't want to pray out loud. I might say something wrong and people might laugh and, you know, it's just, it, it can get stressful. I understand that. But there were many of you actually that spent time, took the opportunity to pray uh, on that Wednesday night a while back. And I was very pleased. But still, this is an area that is a weak link for us. Now, why is prayer a weak area for our youth ministry? Well, I think that it is because it is a weak area for us as individuals, myself included. I mean, I'm, let's, let's be honest. Let's talk plainly. I'm the leader here. If the group's going to pray more, I probably need to be the one leading that. And I feel as if I do not do that enough. And so it's a weak area for many of us. If I were to go around and ask the question, which I will not do because it would be quite embarrassing, but I think that many of us would find that we're not alone. If I were to go around the room and say, okay, uh, how much time do you spend praying throughout the day or throughout the week? We would find ourselves in good company, most of us going, mm, not nearly enough. You know, I prayed before my science test last week. Or I prayed before my, uh, you know, my, my macaroni and cheese yesterday. Uh, or I prayed that my team would win, you know, last night or whatever. And we pray uh, sporadically. And as we will find today further on in our study, we need to be praying a lot more. But it's, it's a difficult area for myself also. I, I'm confessing that to you, that it's a difficult area. Because we live in SoCal, baby, right? Sun, sand. We, 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 we're, we're on the move, man. We got to hustle. We got to flow. Kill a Cali. That's where we're at. We got we to keep going. We got to keep moving. We're like sharks. Don't stop swimming. If you stop swimming, you'll die. 
So we got to keep moving. We got to hustle. We got to, what's the next thing? And what's, what do you got, you know, 10 steps ahead and we're planning and we're making moves. And, you know, if I, if I'm ever going to accomplish anything, I need to do, you know, these 20 things and we can keep ourselves busy from sun up to sun down, just on the move, trying to, trying to keep ourselves busy. And what happens is, is that flows into our spiritual life and we can go, Hey, God, I'd really like to pray, but I, I've already got a plan. I'm in a hurry. I'm on the move. So just, could you just bless what I'm doing as I go? Because I don't have time to stop and pray. It's a difficult thing. In order to pray, oftentimes, not always, but oftentimes prayer will require that I stop what I'm doing and I focus. Now, can I pray while I'm doing some activity? Absolutely I can. But I think that we could all agree that uh, our, our most effective times, our sweetest times of prayer are when we stop and we slow down and we think and we concentrate on the Lord and we pray. And, you know, those are, those are sweet times. And, and so we want to make sure that we're developing that in our lives individually. Uh, but individual is not what I'm talking about, although these things are applicable to individuals. But I am really addressing all of us, myself and all of us as a group. What is it that we can learn? What can we do? Now, we're going to get into that first section, which is the corrupt prayer. But we'll do that in just a minute. Let's begin by reading Luke chapter 18, verses 9 and 10 to get some context. Verse 9 says, also he, that is referring to Jesus. Also he spoke this parable to some who trusted in themselves. Now, when I say parable, many people believe that a parable is a make-believe story that Jesus used to teach some heavenly or spiritual lesson. Now, I would argue that just because it's called a parable doesn't mean that it's a fake story with made-up characters. In fact, as we go through, I believe that the elements of this story would show to us that this was an actual event that Jesus was privy to, that he, that he uh, uh, encountered this interaction. So we'll get into that, but this is a parable, which means it's a story that Jesus is using to teach a lesson, a spiritual lesson. What is this parable about? He said that he spoke this parable to some, not to everybody, but to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and despised or hated others. I'm righteous, you're not, and I hate you for it. Okay? He says in verse 10, he starts out by saying, two men went up to the temple to pray. One a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. Now, a temple was the proper place, to, or a proper place to pray. Didn't have to pray in the temple, but it was a good place to pray. To go to church and pray, that's a good place to pray. But obviously, we know that to pray outside of the church is also a wonderful thing. But let me ask you a question, see if anybody's feeling wild this afternoon. Anybody feeling daring? Can anybody tell us what a Pharisee is? Does anybody know what a Pharisee is? And can you tell us what it is? Okay, this is, yes. Or Jews, a religious leader. A religious leader for the Jews. Thank you very much, Noah. Uh, it's wonderful. I'll have to share that good news with uh, Pastor Chris Plaza. Hey, all of your students came over to high school, but they don't know what a Pharisee is. Only Noah knew. So he'll be glad to hear that. So it's a Pharisee, it's a religious leader. And this is one of the Jewish religious leaders. And it says that he's a, a Pharisee and then a tax collector. These are the two people that came in to pray. Now, the tax collector, I will share with you because, you know, Pharisee, you weren't really sure. I'm sure the tax collector, you won't know what that's all about. A tax collector is somebody who, hold on, collects taxes. I know, I know can write that down. Tax collector is someone who collects taxes. Now, as you can imagine, tax collectors back then are just as they were just as loved as tax collectors are now, right? Don't you love it when you saved up your babysitting money or your lawn mowing money or your chore money or your birthday money, and then you finally saved up enough money to go get those new J's that are at Foot Locker at the mall, and you're like, oh, that's this is it. Or, you know, you're going to Forever 21, or you're going, no, Forever 21 is pretty cheap, huh? But you go, to, you know, you're going to buy some expensive, you know, piece of clothing or shoes or whatever it is, and then you go there, and you're like, all right, man, I'm gonna buy this item, it's 80 bucks, I saved up my 80 bucks, 
You take them to the front, they ring them up, and they're like, okay, that'll be $92.53. And you're like, wait, what? Like, no, the price tag says 80. And they're like, oh yeah, taxes. Don't you just love the government at that point? Aren't you just so excited about that? Like, oh man, an extra $12. This is just wonderful. I love this. Of course we don't. We hate that. We don't like that. We don't like that. Well, this tax collector would not have been admired by anybody. And I'll tell you why. On top of collecting taxes, you need to know that this would have been a Jewish man that had collected taxes. How do we know that? Well, because in our story, the Pharisee sees the tax collector. And, well, that means they both would have been in the temple in the same court or same area. Because if this tax collector was a woman, or if this tax collector was a Gentile, not a Jew, he or she would have been in a different room, separate area. They kept everybody separate. They had a court for the men. They had a court for the women. They had a court for the Gentiles. These two individuals are in the same area praying. And so we know that this tax collector was a Jew. You go, so, okay, so what? So why would, why would people not like them? I'll tell you why. Because the tax collector would not have been working for Israel. The tax collector would have been working for Rome. You go, Rome? Rome, because Rome was the occupying force at this time. And in order for this individual to be a tax collector, he would have been collecting taxes for the Roman government. And who would he have been collecting taxes from? From his own people. So this is a Jewish man collecting money from his own Jewish, his fellow Jewish people, and giving it to the Roman government. The Jews did not like the Roman government. And yet, here's one of their countrymen taking the money, giving it to the Roman government. On top of that, tax collectors, they had the authority of Rome. So as you came into the city, they would inspect your things. And if Trinity were coming into the city and I saw that she had a backpack or a bag or she's carrying something, I would stop her as a tax collector and I would say, hey, what is it you've got there? Oh, you know what, it's this bag and I've got these things in it. And I would look in, maybe I'd find some gummy bears or something and i go, hey, um, what you've got here, Rome requires that you pay taxes on it. And maybe I go, what you, okay, yeah, you, you owe Rome $3 for these things. However, because I've got a family and my little boy needs shoes, I am allowed, according to the Roman government, to charge on top of that whatever I want. So I can say, yeah, I see that you got these gummy bears. That's $3 for Rome, but it's an extra $3 for me. So pay up. And there's nothing that you can say or do. You don't like it? Talk to Caesar. You ain't gonna talk to Caesar. You'll lose your head. So you gotta pay up. And so many of the Jewish tax collectors were known for that. They had to pay their own bills and own whatever they had, buy food. And so they were charging exuberant amounts over and above whatever Rome was requiring. So this tax collector would have been well hated in the community. The tax collector knows that, and we'll get to that in just a moment. So we've got the two characters, the two parties in this story. Now we get into verses 11 and 12, which for us begins our note section. For those of you that take notes, verses 11 and 12 is the corrupt prayer. Why is it corrupt? Let's look at it. Verse 11, the Pharisee. So we, we uh, zone in on, uh, zoom in on the Pharisee first. The Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself. Now notice, he prayed thus with himself. And then he says this, God, I thank you that I am not like other men. He's addressing God, but Jesus said he's praying with himself. He certainly is not praying privately. That'll be obvious here in just a moment. He's not praying privately. He's praying publicly. He's make, making a spectacle of himself, but he prayed thus with himself. So we learn right away our one subpoint in this section under corrupt prayer is that it was a selfish or self-centered prayer because he prayed thus with himself. He addresses God or at least says the name God, but he's really not praying to God. You go, how do you know that? We'll find out. 
I'm going to read these verses, bless you, verses 11 and 12. Here's what I want you to do for me. I know it's rough, man. It's almost lunchtime. We'll have you out of here in a little bit. But I want you to do something with me. I want you to count how many times the word or letter I, the word I is used. Not letter. Let's go with the word I. Okay? How many times is the word I used in his prayer? God, I thank you that I am not like other men, extortioners unjust, adulterers, or even this tax collector. Verse 12, I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I possess. How many times did the word I get used? You know what? Five times. Five times. Five times. So it becomes blatantly clear that this Pharisee in his prayer is not focused on anything other than himself. Seems that it's all he can do is talk about himself. I, 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 I. Now, in his prayer, the first thing that he does is he talks about what he's not doing. He says, God, I thank you that I am not like other men. So in other words, thank you that I'm such a great man, you know, set apart from all of those normal men. And then he tells us what kind of men. He says, extortioners. I'm not an extortioner. I'm not unjust. I'm not an adulterer. Or even as this tax collector. You see what he did there? Now, let me ask you a question. How did he know the tax collector was there praying? Well, that is because he was evidently looking around. Thank you, Lord that I am not an extortioner, I'm not unjust, I'm not an adulterer, and I'm certainly not this tax collector over here. Now, we'll find out in just a minute that this Pharisee must have been looking all over the place because of the positioning of the tax collector, and I'll remind you, but we'll get to that in a couple of minutes. But evidently, this Pharisee, as he's praying, he's focused on himself, and he's focused on whoever it is that's around. It says that he addressed God. However, we find out that he's not really addressing God. He may say God, but what he's doing is he's talking about himself, promoting himself, and he's talking to whoever is within earshot. And certainly there would have been other people there praying, and he wants to make sure that all of them know, God, thank you so much that I am not like, a, I'm not an extortioner, I'm not unjust, I'm not an adulterer, and I'm certainly not like this nasty tax collector over here. It's self-promotion. Now, we know about self-promotion, right? Because we live in the age of social media. Now, I like social media, okay? I'm not poo-pooing social media. Some social media, but not all social media. I like social media. Uh, I, I waste entirely too much time on social media uh, because what happens is, some of you may know, Pastor Chris, sometimes I, I come across a video, you know, of somebody getting hurt or falling off of a roof or something, and it's just the funniest thing to me. And then I want to I want to swipe, you know, because I want to see the next one. It's like swipe up. What's, what's the next? Oh man, look at that, you know. And oh my gosh, look at this. It's incredible to me. It is incredible to me. First of all, what people do. It's like, how did you ever think that that was going to turn out okay? But secondly, it's incredible to me that people catch these things on video. It's like, how did you how did you know? But I guess there are some situations you just know, like, oh, uh, she's climbing up. Get your videos out. Get your camera out because something, something's going to happen. Something's going to go down. And so you just know that's going to happen. My family oftentimes, you know, show me videos or whatever. And, you know, after I'm done laughing, of course, I'll just, so often I'm just, I'm, I just tell them, I'll say, man, some people have way too much time on their hands. Like, how did they make this video? Like, how long did this take them? This is crazy. So I do like social media, but obviously so much of social media can be self-promotion, Right? So what we're doing. We've got our own little, you know, our own little page, our own little stage where, you know, this is, you know, come to my feed and see all the great things that I do. And, you know, here's me on vacation at Paris Lake. You know, I know, isn't that great? And look over here. Isn't this wonderful? Here's the green beans that I ate for dinner. And oh yeah, look, here's my cute little niece. And uh, yeah, look over here. These are the new tires that my dad bought or whatever. And we've just, you know, we got everything up there trying to let everybody know how great we are, how wonderful we look. Look at my new hair, look at my new shoes. And it's self-promotion. And we've got to be careful with all of that. This Pharisee certainly was in the business of self-promotion. 
He's a religious leader. No doubt other people are watching him to say like, oh, well, how does he do it? You know, if you've got a religious leader, if, we, if we're praying, you might want to wait on Pastor Chris and go, well, let's, let me listen to what Pastor Chris says or how he does it. And then, oh, okay, that's what you, okay. I, let me, you know, now let me try it or whatever. This Pharisee certainly would have been watched by everybody there. Like, oh, there's the Pharisee. He's praying. How does he pray? And he wanted to make sure that everybody knew exactly how he was praying. God, I thank you that I, and I, and I, and I, and I, and I, and I. He's all about himself. All about himself. It's a corrupt prayer because it's a self-centered or a selfish prayer. Now, let's move on to our next section, which is verses 13 and 14, which is the correct prayer. Let's go back. and We've got a little bit of a delay there. Correct prayer, verses 13 and 14. Why is it a correct prayer? In verse 13, it says, and the tax collector. So we've looked at the Pharisee. Now we look at the tax collector. The tax collector standing afar off. The tax collector, tax collector has separated himself standing afar off. Now, take a wild guess. Why do you think the tax collector is standing afar off? Anybody feeling wild this afternoon and you want to you want to just take a wild guess and see if maybe you get it right? Anybody? What do you think? Wonderful, Cassidy. I think that's an excellent guess. Now, we're not told specifically, but that would be my guess. Any other guesses? Anybody else? Anybody? It might have something to do also with him being a tax collector and the fact that, dude, nobody likes you. You can't eat with us, right? It's get away. He may know that, and so he separated himself. But as it goes on, it develop, the picture of him develops. And the tax collector, standing afar off, would not so much as raise his eyes to heaven. Now, raising your eyes to heaven and your hands to heaven during worship and even in prayer was a normal Jewish uh, uh, motion or act. They would pray like this, as if to say, God, my arms are open, give me everything you want to give me. But looking up into heaven was normal. But for this Jewish man, his eyes are locked somewhere else. He would not so much as raise his eyes to heaven. So my assumption, well, obviously we know that his, if his eyes were not raised, that means that they were down. I don't know if his eyes were closed, if they were open but locked on in a down position. I don't know. But he would not lift his eyes. Now, remember, I told you I would remind you. Remember the Pharisee? As he's praying, I thank you that I'm not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or like this nasty tax collector over here. So as he's praying, he's busy looking around. Like, oh, who's listening to me? Ha! Yes, I'm not unjust. I'm not an extortioner. He's making sure that everybody knows exactly what he's praying. And because his eyes are open, he's in somebody else's business. Do you remember when you were little? And your parents taught you to pray, eyes closed, head bowed, hands together, right? And sometimes you'll even see artwork like that, you know, it'll be like the hands of Jesus and it'll be like, you know, they're praying. But then as you begin to read the Bible, you go, wait a minute, I don't really see anybody folding their hands to pray and like, why do they do that? Well, years from now, when you have your own little brat, kids, kids, when you have your own little kids, you will sit down with your family and you'll go, hey, sit down at the dinner table, let's pray together. And then you will bow your head and you'll say, oh, and you'll begin to pray. Close your eyes. And then you'll hear something. And you'll have some wild little boy or wild little girl. Okay, and I'm praying that you'll have lots of wild little ones. But you'll hear a noise and you'll look up and you will see your daughter or your son at the dinner table doing a handstand. You will see them picking at their green beans and giving them to the dog. You will see them taking a drink of the soda. And you'll go, hey, what are you doing? We're praying. And they'll, oh, sorry about that. And you know what you'll tell them? You'll tell them, hey, put that down. Put your hands together. Close your eyes. Bow your head. Ooh. Why? That removes distractions. That's what that's for. But notice these guys praying out loud. But this guy, this tax collector, he would not even raise his eyes to heaven. But instead, it says in verse 13, he beat his breast. Why did he do that? 
Why would he do that? He beat his breast because it's, a, it's an outward sign of what's going on on the inside. And he wants to get at that sin in his heart. And he wants to pull it out and he wants to beat it out of himself. And he's beating his chest and he's saying, oh, I hate what I am and who I am and what I've done and what I've become and what I'm doing to other people. That's what that beating of the breast is. It's not so that he can be in some worship video on YouTube, you know, just being real super dramatic, you know, uh, you know, making sure that everybody sees. That's not what that is. His eyes are locked down. He's beating his breast. And then it says this. Here's his prayer. Finally, here's his prayer. God, be merciful to me, a sinner. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven words. God, be merciful to me, a sinner. It's hard when there's public prayer going on, right? And maybe you feel like, man, I want to pray. I want to pray out loud. Like, okay, come on. Like, let's go. Let's do this. It's hard because you start to think, well, wait a minute. What if I say something wrong? And if I, what if I, what if I say, you know, the wrong thing and then somebody just thinks I'm really stupid and then they don't, you know, maybe they don't want to sit by me anymore or whatever, or they laugh. And we, 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 we terrify ourselves. But I get it. I get it. Public speaking, that's, that's, a, that's a scary thing for a lot of people. But I want you to notice this guy's prayer. God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Done. That's it. No amen, no thou God art anything. It's just God, be merciful to me, a sinner. That's it. There's no specific length that is required in prayer. Like, you know, you, okay, well, okay, go ahead, everybody. You got to pray for 20 seconds. Here we go. Ready and go. That's not it. God, be merciful to me, a sinner. That's it. How long is that? I mean, how long is that even? It's like two seconds. God, be merciful to me, a sinner. That's it. As he's beating his chest. We see here that this correct prayer is a correct prayer because it is selfless. Yes, he mentions himself, but you will notice the only thing he says about himself is he needs mercy because he's a sinner. He knows who he is. Do I know who I am? Or do I consider myself much too righteous? <laughs> I don't need to pray for mercy. I'm no sinner. God, just continue to bless me because I'm doing so great. This man's prayer was a correct prayer because it was a selfless prayer. All it was was, God, have mercy on me. I'm a sinner. That's it. That's all it was. That coupled together with his posture, with the other things that are going on here. Notice what Jesus said in verse 14. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. Who was the other? The religious leader. Jesus said, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone, now Jesus introduces this biblical uh, uh, principle here. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. Uh, per usual, Jesus, you know, uh, introduces those, you know, those kind of opposites, you know, that the Bible does so well. Like, you want to find your life? You got to lose it. Uh, you want to be exalted? You've got to lower yourself. It does that so well. And Jesus here is showing us, he's given us a lesson here from these two individuals using that context of prayer to say that, listen, if you are glorifying yourself, man, that's all you get. Jesus is going to humble you. But if you will humble yourself, Jesus will exalt you. What a wonderful principle that is. So we want to, what we want to do is we don't want to self-promote. We would rather be Jesus-promoted. I don't want to promote myself. I want Jesus to promote me. So I'll just wait. I'll humble myself, and I'll let him, when he's ready, lift me up. Now, I'm going to ask several questions here, and I noticed in the first service that I missed one of the questions on the screen. So when I get to it, I'll just say it. There won't be anything on the screen. But here's the first question. We just want to hit the basics. As we go through uh, these next four weeks, this four-part series, you will just get the basics. In other words, today, we're not giving, I'm not giving an exhaustive study on prayer. This is not everything you ever needed to know about prayer. I'm just giving you some basics because that's where we're at. We want to develop our prayer life, 
We just need to go back to the basics. When I was coaching soccer years ago, that's what we did, always back to the basics. And I would take these teams with little girls, because my daughter played, and I would teach these little girls how to pass a ball. And you go, what's that? Yeah, this team of little girls would get on the field and they would just blow people away because they could pass a ball. Who would have thought? Just go back to the basics. So that's what we're doing here. I'm giving you some basics. What is prayer? Prayer, very simply, two things, or at least these are the two things that I, I'm going to mention about it. What is prayer? Prayer simply is communication. When I am praying, I can be praying to God. I could be praying to Buddha. I could be praying to Allah. I could be praying to any other God or religious leader or statue or candle or person, whatever, whoever it is that I am praying to in its most simplest form, its most basic form, all it is is com a communication. That's all I'm doing. I'm talking to the individual, whoever it might be, okay? Now, in this case, the Pharisee, what did he do? He was communicating. He said God, but he was communicating with himself and anybody else over there, or over there that was listening. That's all he was communicating with. The tax collector, he was dialed in. He was communicating with God, okay? So it's communication. So in the Pharisee's case, it was corrupt communication. In the tax collector's uh, case, it was correct communication. Why, or, or here, why was it, um, let me put this up there, why was the Pharisee, uh, why was his communication corrupt? Am I just, you know, maybe, uh, Lord, would you please bless this uh, uh, pointer? Uh, I'm not really sure what's going on. Sierra, would you do me a big favor back there? Would you click on the, uh, the next one uh, after communication? There it is. Thank you very much. Not sure what's going on, but um, after communication, prayer, basically, generally speaking, is counting on whoever it is that you're praying to. Whoever it is that you're praying to, you're counting on them for something. You're counting on them for their resources, is what you're doing. In our case, because we belong to God, we are counting on God's resources. I spent the first 20 years of my life counting on my own resources. And at the end of that 20 years, I had no job, I had no money in the bank, I had a broken down car, and I had a baby on the way, and I wasn't married yet. That's what I had at the end. I was counting on my own resources. That's what I had at the end. When we're praying to someone, what we're doing is not only communicating, but we're communicating with them because we're counting on their resources, their supply. So when I'm praying to God, I'm counting on his supply of whatever it is. Remember the tax collector? What was it that he asked for? Anybody remember? Started with an M, finished with a mercy. He was asking God for mercy. Thank you, Trinity. And God's got lots of mercy. In fact, it says that his mercies are new every day, every morning. So it's a good thing to ask for. He knew that God had an endless supply, and I would imagine that he probably spent lots of time in that temple praying for mercy, and God hadn't let him down yet. Whatever you are, whoever it is that you're communicating with in prayer, you're counting on their resources, so you got to be careful. The Pharisee was counting on himself, communicating with himself, counting on himself, and thus he only had whatever resources he had, which run out quick. We want to make sure that we're praying to God. Why do I say that? Because sometimes, let me give you an example from my own life. Sometimes I can be praying, I can start out good, like, Lord, I just want to thank you so much, you know, for the day or for whatever, you know, whatever's going on or whatever you've given. Lord, I really need some help because my car is going to need some work and it's going to cost $1,000. And then here's what happens. Somewhere in there, I switch and I'm, I'm like, Lord, I just pray that you would help me to make enough money. Or, Lord, help me to buy just the perfect lottery ticket. No, I'm just kidding. But, you know, whatever it is, I'm counting on, I, in the middle of my prayer, I start coming up with my own plan. Like, Lord, I need $1,000. And I think that if I go ask this person if I could borrow 200 and I ask this person if I could borrow 600 and then if I go, you know, do this work, and then if I rob this bank, and we start coming up with this scheme. Instead of, God, I need 1000 bucks to pay, pay for this car. Would you please supply that? You, whatever you want to give, Lord, you, you give it. 
And so we want to be careful that as we're communicating, that we're counting on God's resources. Here's the next question. The next question is, yeah, I'm going to need some help from that back room please. Why should I pray? I should pray because, number one, Jesus said to. Jesus said to. In Luke chapter 18, verse 1, it says this about Jesus. Then he spoke a parable to them that men always ought to pray and not lose heart. So he said there in Luke chapter 18 that, hey, uh, everybody should pray and, and, and not lose heart. But Jesus said to. So if Jesus said to, then I probably should do it. Here's the second thing up here, and it is Jesus did because he needed to. In John chapter 5, verse 30, and in chapter 17, verse 1, Jesus did it. In John chapter 5, verse 30, Jesus actually said this, I can of myself do nothing as I hear I judge, and my judgment is righteous because I do not seek my own, but the will of the Father who sent me. What was Jesus praying about? Sometimes he would take off and just go up on a mountain by himself to pray. What was he praying about? He was communicating with the Father. Why? Because he needed to know what the Father's will was. In John chapter 17, verse 1, Jesus spoke these words, lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, so it tells us there that he prayed, Jesus prayed. And Jesus prayed because he needed to, because he needed the Father's will. He needed the Father's resources. So if Jesus did it, that's a really good reason. But there's a third reason why I should pray. And that is found in John 16, verses 23 through 24, because Jesus promised joy as a result of prayer. He said, and in that day, you will ask me nothing. Most assuredly, I say to you, whatever you ask the Father in my name, he will give you. Until now, you have asked nothing in my name. Ask and you will receive that your joy may be full. So praying brings joy. How does that work? Because as I pray and ask God for things, he answers and then that brings me joy, knowing that I've received from him, that he's given me his best. Here's the one that doesn't end up on the screen. Sorry about that. It's totally Matt's fault, but I won't blame him for it. It really wasn't his fault. It was my fault. I'm the one that does the slides. How should I pray? Won't, won't be found up there. I should pray. There's lots of different things that we could say about this. But I'll just point out one thing. We should pray with humility. Remember the tax collector in verse 13? Standing afar off, wouldn't raise his eyes to heaven, beat his breast, asking for mercy because he was a sinner. We should be praying with humility. I say that because sometimes you can get on YouTube, man. And you can find somebody praying on, on YouTube, man. They're just like praying, man, just the authority, the blood of Jesus, the name of Jesus, and now Satan's going to run, and the demons are going to run, and uh, I've got the power of Jesus, and it's all about me, and I'm doing great, and we've got all of this stuff, and I'm so proud. we got to be careful. Our prayer should be humble prayer. It should be done with humility. Here's the next question that you're going to find up on your screen. Where and when should I pray? Well, number one, I should pray always. We find that in 1 Thess, that means 1 Thessalonians, chapter 5, verse 17, Paul said this, pray without ceasing. That's it. In other words, pray without stopping or don't stop praying. Simple. Just always pray. Not just for your meals. Not just for your science test, not just for your food, not just for whatever. Well, we should just be in the constant habit of praying, just always talking to God, always consulting him, always asking for his blessing, always asking for his mercy. We should just always be talking to God. So always, but then secondly, where and when should I pray? Everywhere. Paul says in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 8, I desire therefore that the men pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands without wrath and doubting. Now, why did he tell the men there, I desire that men pray everywhere. Is that because the women don't know how to pray? Keep your little puny prayers over there, women. No, I think two things. I think it's safe to include the women in that because women should be praying also. However, I think it's my opinion as a guy that the women were already praying. They didn't need to be told to pray. 
because so often that's the case. The spiritual leader in so many families is mom. She's always praying. She's always reading the Bible. She's always telling me about Bible stories and Bible studies. And so I think that probably the women were already busy praying. And then Paul was probably like, um, guys, like, let's go. Get, get it together. You should, be, you should be praying also. But I, uh, he says, I desire, therefore, that the men pray everywhere. That looks a lot different from my prayer life, isn't it? If I'm out somewhere and it's time to eat dinner, it's like espionage, man. Okay, family. Shh. All right, everybody, here we go. Lord, bless the food in Jesus' name, amen. You know, it's like, man, don't, don't let anybody hear us. And he's saying, no, I'm, I desire that men pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands. We try, we go, oh, 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 well, I don't have holy hands. That means I don't, I don't have to pray anywhere. No, he's not saying you have to have perfect hands, just hands that belong to the Lord. Lord, these are yours, you know, give me anything you want. Now, here's an important question. The next one up there, does God hear and answer my prayers? The first answer is yes, he does. Second Chronicles 7, 14 and 15. God said this, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and heal their land. Now my eyes will be open and my ears attentive to prayer made in this place. So, does God hear and answer prayers? Yes, he does. However, this is the area, this is the one question that turns a lot of people off. In fact, there have been lots of people throughout the ages who have said, I don't believe in God anymore because I prayed for my mom to be healed and she wasn't healed and she died. And I can't believe that God would let someone die. What? Everybody dies. What are you talking about? But I get it. I understand. I get it. It's, 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 it's frustrating. I get it. You're praying for something. You're asking. And I thought, you know, whatever I asked for, God was going to give me. Well, maybe he did. We'll talk about that. Yes, wait is an answer. Wait is an answer. When you were younger, you went to Target with your mom, walked in, Mommy, please, can I have Icy? Mommy, please, can you get me some Star Starbies? Mom, please, can you buy me some Legos? And your mom said, if you behave yourself, I'll get you something. That was an answer. Yes, but wait. We'll see how you act. But it's an answer. Yes, but wait. In John chapter 11, I've got two different verses up there, verses 6 and 17. What, what, what's going on in that, in that story? And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to move through these fast because we got to get you guys out of here pretty quick, okay? Your parents might start texting you. And if you got to go, you got to go. That's okay. But um, uh, uh, we'll make this quick. John chapter 11, Jesus had a friend that was sick and dying. So in, in verse 6, he finds out and he goes, oh, Lazarus is sick and dying. Okay. It says, so he waited there two more days where he was. He didn't go to Lazarus. He waited two days. And then in verse 17, by the time he gets there, Lazarus has already been dead four days. And you're like, why did he wait? Well, that's because further on in the story, Jesus decides that he's going to resurrect Lazarus from the dead. That was way better than just healing him. Be healed or brought back from the dead. I mean, who wouldn't want to be a zombie, right? So it's like, you know what? Uh, uh, I'm not going to go and I'm going to answer, but the answer is wait. And he had a better plan. And sometimes you're just praying because, man, that guy is so cute, Lord, and I just have to have him. Would you please, you know, just, you know, make him see me and make him see that I'm so beautiful. And the Lord is like, mm, no, we're going to wait on that because he's got a better plan. And sometimes it's, oh, that younger lady, and see, man, she's so hot. And Lord, would you just please give her to me? And he's like, mm, no, just, just wait. And <laughs> just wait. You'll see her in five years, and you'll be glad that I told you no. Okay? Here's another, here's another one. Does God hear and answer prayers? Yes. No is an answer. That's an answer. In Mark chapter 5, wonderful story there. One of my favorites about the gathering demoniac. This man who lived in Gadara, lived up in the mountains. Jesus and his disciples pull up in a boat to the shore. As soon as they pull up, this man comes running out of nowhere. Check this out. Completely naked. Not a scrap of clothing on him. 
I would have been in that boat paddling as fast as I could. Like, nah. Okay? He comes running. He bows. He throws himself down in front of Jesus. He's got chains on his limbs because he was demon-possessed by so many demons. He was so powerful that the people in the city had tried to lock him up, and he was able to break the chains because of the demons. And check this out. The demons, they know who Jesus is, and they go, hey, the Jesus, they, they say to Jesus, Jesus, don't send us into the abyss. In other words, don't send us into judgment. And Jesus goes, okay, I'll answer that request. And he sends them into pigs, and then the pigs take off off this cliff. It's an incredible story. Then next, the people of the town see that. They go, hey, you ruined our pigs. So then they say to Jesus, they go, hey, would you please get out of here? And he says, I'll honor that request. Yes, I'll leave. And he gets back in the boat. And as he begins to take off, we're told in verse 18, and when he got into the boat, he who had been demon possessed, because the man actually was healed, he was freed from all of those demons. And we're told that he was then sitting clothed, important point, and in his right mind. He had been transformed radically. But as Jesus is leaving, it says this, he who had been demon possessed begged him that he might be with him. Jesus, please, I'm a brand new Christian. Let me go in the boat and leave with you. And Jesus, in verse 19, did not permit him, but said, go home to your friends and tell them what great things the Lord has done for you and how he has had compassion on you. And it says that he went throughout the Decapolis, the 10 cities, proclaiming all that Jesus had done. And can you imagine, had Jesus taken with him with him in the boat, he would have went to the next town and said, hey, look, everybody, this man used to be demon-possessed. Except now he's clothed, and he's in his right mind. However, if that same man stays there, and goes back to his parents' house, and to his friend's house, and into his old neighborhood, and back to his old high school, and goes, hey, look at me. And they go, oh, last time I saw you, I saw everything. But last time I saw you, you were demon-possessed. What happened? Then he could say, I met this guy named how much more effective would that be? So sometimes we're asking for things and God's like, no, that's an answer. I've got a better plan. Last one, and I won't go through all of these, but let me just show you. Here's the last one. Can anything stop my prayers? Let's go ahead and get those up there. Unbelief, James 1, that can stop my prayers. Selfishness, James, selfishness? <laughs> selfishness, James 4, verses 1 through 3, or verse 3, sorry. And then unforgiveness can hinder my prayers. Mark chapter 11, verses 25 and 26. Sin, certainly. Isaiah 59, 2. And if you need those after, because I know I'm going through them quickly, we got to get you out of here. Well, let's move on to the last slide, because it might be that you are feeling like, hey, my prayer life, like, I'm, I'm blowing it. Well, check this out. 1 John 1, 9. Here's some more prayer. If we confess our sins... He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If you're feeling like I'm falling way short, God forgive me. Guess what? Good news. He's faithful and just to forgive us of our sins. He'll give you a brand new start. We need that. We need that as a youth group. Uh, before I close in prayer, two things.